want to talk to you this morning about contending. And I know that's like a combative type word, but Scripture tells us that we have to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, the Bible tells us that we have to be good soldiers, that we're going to have to endure some suffering, those of us that call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk to you today out of uh, Jude, um, which is a, a super short book of the Bible. People ask me sometimes, like, what do you think is the most amazing miracle in all Scripture? You know, water into wine, Jesus walking on the water, Lazarus from the dead. And I think, no, it's actually Jude, because Jude was Jesus' brother. And if you can convince your brother that you're God, like, that is absolutely, like, incredible. But he did. And so Jude writes this, uh, this, this book of the Bible that I think is so relevant to what we're going through today in the body of Christ. Does anybody notice there is a little uptick of hostility towards the church in Christianity? Has anybody picked up on that? Like it is an election year and things are kind of crazy and I'm sure they're gonna get more and more crazy. I got a kick out of this. Somebody sent me a video the other day and there was a lady on, on television, on CNN, and she was talking about basically like what was wrong with America. And she said there are these people and they actually believe that God's laws supersede like everything. <laughs> these Christian nationalists is what she called us. And she's like, they are the ones that are really causing the problems in the world today. And I'm like, okay, the Declaration of Independence, like second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are endowed with certain unalienable rights. Like, yeah, the people that founded this country, they also believed God's laws supersede everything. But to listen to a lot of media, to listen to a lot of, of culture, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that was necessarily the case. And what I love about Jude's book of the Bible here is that he really addresses this. He addresses what does it look like to contend for your faith when the, the world you live in is kind of crazy. So I'm just going to jump right in. This is Jude, Jude chapter 1. It says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you appealing to you and me to contend. Everybody say contend for the faith. It says, that was once and for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who, divert, who pervert, they twist the truth of grace of our God into sensuality, and they deny our only master, our Lord, in Jesus Christ. So we live in this world that really is honestly very, very hostile to Christianity. I'm sure you already know this. There was an article that I read, and, and I love the way the guy laid this out. It, it's a guy named Aaron Wren, and he wrote about something called the three worlds of evangelism. And he was kind of talking about this, this world that we live in right, right now, but it hasn't always been this way. And he kind of breaks it into these three categories. He said, really, the world and the culture's view of Christianity uh, was very positive up until about 1994. There was a shift. And this is the world that I grew up in. Like, I, I literally remember my football coach um, asking us what we learned at church on Sunday. I had a teacher that if we could answer her Bible questions in public school, then we would, we would be able to skip our homework assignment. It was just the world was very pro-Christian. Our culture was very pro-Christian. Um, in Times Square, like right around now, getting ready for Easter, they would put up a, a illuminated cross on skyscrapers, like it was common. It was just very, very pro-Judeo-Christian values. I, I thought this was kind of fas fascinating. So in the 80s, banks, like if you wanted a loan, this was still common practice, they would ask you what church you went to. They, they would want to know if you were in a, a good standing member of, of what church, because they reasoned, well, if you go to church, you're moral, you keep your word, and you will probably repay your loan. Like, like this still happened. How many of you know that those days are gone? We, we had the moral majority, Jerry Falwell, if you remember those days. And, and in 1994, you had 
for, for one of the first times, you had a large group of, of evangelical Christians that all came into power in Washington. But there was a, a pretty seismic shift that took place in about 1995. And he says, basically, society took a neutral stance towards Christianity. It no longer had privileged status. It wasn't necessarily disfavored, but being publicly known as a Christian was neither positive or negative in the public square. And there was some like some big, I guess, cultural defining moments. He kind of talked about like the Simpsons. You guys remember that? Like I wasn't allowed to watch that show growing up. Brady was. That's what's wrong with him today. He watched the Simpsons. But it, it was depicted like for one of the first times, like the dad of the, the, of the house, the man of the house was like a total idiot. And his kids had to run everything. And then the Christian character, Ned Flanders, is this huge dork. I, like that was a big deal. How many know the, the show Friends? Listen, I, I know Friends is funny and I, and I get it. But that show alone probably wreaked more havoc on my personal generation uh, in regards to normalizing sin. You know those six characters on Friends? They had 138 sexual partners. If you have 138 sexual partners in the real world, you're going to be emotionally bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt, probably physically bankrupt. Like, it's not going to go well. But there was just this big shift, and it wasn't that you couldn't be a Christian. It's just that it wasn't favored the way that it was previously. So you had a, a big shift. Now... He says, since 2015, we've, we've kind of charted new territory. And this is what he wrote. He said, society now has a negative view of Christianity. I promise you in Dallas, I see this all the time. Being known as a Christian is a social negative, particularly in the elite domains of society. I, I had some graphs that I thought about bringing up here. I wanted to put on the screen. But you can always follow the money. And if you look at just, for instance, like the tech sector, I'm talking about like Apple, Netflix, just Google, all of the apps, the technology that we have to use, for the most part, you can look at what causes those donations support. You can actually look up um, what, what causes the employees that work for our major tech companies in America, where their money goes. And in the universities, in the tech sector, uh, certainly in education, in journalism, it, it is virtually all, like over 90% anti-God, anti-family, and really what I would consider anti-America, and that's the world that we find ourselves living in right now, which is why I'm talking, and it's why Jude wrote that we were going to have to contend, because if you have a biblical worldview, it's very common for you to be labeled a bigot, it's very common for you to be called a, a transphobe, a homophobe, or whatever. And what I'm telling you today is that if you are going to be able to contend for your faith, you are going to have to be able to laugh off emotional scare tactics. You're going to have to learn to stand up on the truth of God's word. And I'm telling you, it's absolutely critical that we do it right now. Because this is what I see. I see the world watching. And, and a lot of people that I know, they look around and they see the absolute madness in society. They see the chaos. They see what's happening. And they know the schools won't do anything about it. They, they, they know the universities are not going to do anything about it. But they're looking for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up. Scripture calls us the pillar and foundation of truth. They are looking for answers, and I'm here to tell you today that it is the church of Jesus Christ that has truth because the Bible will always be relevant. It's not just relevant. Relevance is something that changes on a whim. Our culture decides what is in fashion and what is out of fashion. The word of the living God is eternal. And what God's word says about marriage and family and salvation and purpose and meaning and fulfillment will always be true because it's our creator, God, that made the human soul. He knows the human condition. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about your kids. And he knows what you need, and he knows how to get it to you. And that's it. That's our God. That's why I can boldly and confidently say we have the truth. So, so like, what's, what's going on? My wife sent me a clip 
and this was Blue's Clues. My kids used to watch this back in the day. And we live in a world where, where on the show, there's a trans character leading kids in a gay pride parade. I don't know if you've seen this. This is totally true. One of the most popular shows right now on Amazon Prime is called The has Hotel. And the, the main character is a girl. She calls herself the Princess of Hell, and she's created a rehab facility for the devil and demons, like no joke. And the oppressors are really God and the angels in us. And really, the devil and demons are just the victims uh, of a totalitarian God. Like, that is what we're dealing with right now in 2024. I really believe, though, that what's happening is the devil is majorly overplaying his hand. I see it all the time. I see people that are so fed up. I see guys that just want to go somewhere and hear someone say, hey, no, it's not okay for your little boy to grow up and turn into a woman. It's not okay. And for me to think that and to say that publicly, like, that's all right. And they're looking for that, and they want answers, and they want to know where is the truth. And again, the truth, it's the same place it's always been. It's right here. So we have to contend for our faith. I was thinking about this. I don't know if anybody maybe like has a military background or SWAT background, but there's, there's this term called OODA loop. Has anybody ever heard of this? You know what this is? It's really an acronym, and this is what it stands for. It stands for observe orient, decide, and act. And so this is what happens. If you're in a stressful situation and you're trying to process information, these things have to happen basically before you can act. You have to observe. You have to get, like, oriented. Then you have to decide what you're going to do, and then you have to act it out. Like, this is just the way we're wired. Well, SWAT teams and strike teams, they've learned if they're, you know, rushing into a hotel, if they're breaking open a door, they're, you know, eliminating a bad guy, rescuing rescuing a hostage, they use this to their advantage. And so this is seriously like what they do. They will run in and they will scream like crazy things. Like, where's your mom? What's for dinner? Who had the purple lightsaber? And that's Mace Windu, by the way. Some of you guys knew that. God bless you. But here's, here's what happens. So like when you hear that, your brain just automatically starts trying to answer those questions. And you're wondering like, why is this guy asking me what's for dinner? Why does he want to know where my mom's at? And it just gives them the upper hand for a split second. I think this is happening to the body of Christ. I think there's so much information and so much attack I meet and I talk to people all the time in corporate America, in the workplace, at school, students, college students, and and they're just like, man, I don't know what to say. I don't want to use the wrong pronoun. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to stay here in my spot. I don't want to get shot. And so really what Jude is talking about is contending for our faith. Like what does that look like in 2024? That's what we're talking about today. The first thing I really want to encourage you with is we have to contend for our faith. We do. We, we have a, a part to play. Those of us that call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, like we, we are in the game. We've signed up for this. Jude 1.4, notice it says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. They, they've slipped in. They're there to cause trouble. They're, they're there to pollute the truth. It says they were long ago designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, it always starts and centers around sexuality. Like, like it, I mean, as you just go back, Genesis, everything, like the devil always starts there. And it says, and they deny our master and Lord Jesus Christ. This is why behind our church in Dallas, there's a huge, beautiful building And at one time, man, I'm sure they preached the uncompromising truth of God's word, but right now it has a giant gay flag on the side of their building. And and no joke, like I've literally heard a pastor say, you know, I'm not really sure. Maybe there are other ways to get to God. Maybe it's not just Jesus. That's absolutely insanity. And really what I'm encouraging you with today is that it's time for the church to not be afraid. It's time for us to be able to stand up 
and not be offensive. Listen, I'm not up here talking at all about being quarrelsome. You don't have to go around looking for fights. They find you. I get hate mail on a regular basis. I recently had someone send me a message saying, they hope I get cancer and die. Like, you're not going to have to look hard to find a fight. It will come to you. And the Apostle Paul, he kind of also weighed into this, and he told us some ways that this, this might look. You know, I'm never advocating going out into our world or culture and, like, you can't function in, in your workplace. Like, I'm not an advocate for being weird. God has you working where you're working. And, and I hope there's people that don't know Christ that work with you. Because God may have you there for a reason to reach them. And so we have to, you know, the Scripture talks about these men of Issa, Issa, Issachar in the Bible. And it says they were learned in their culture. And they knew the way that Israel should go. And they knew how to do it. That's the way God wants us to be, not not to be ignorant and out of touch. We have to know and understand our culture because, yes, absolutely, we're called to reach our culture. It's a big, big part of it. But it's the church. This is 1 Timothy 3.15. It's the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of truth. So as we have the truth with us and as we navigate in this culture gone wild, we're called to destroy arguments, but not people. And I was trying to think of some examples in Scripture. Paul, he preached uh, to a, a group that's commonly called Mars Hill. And he was talking to a group called the Athenians. And so he quoted their own poets, their, their own writers. He used the Athenian style of argument and oratory to make his points. Basically what he did is he contextualized. Whenever he, he wrote um, to Timothy, he told Timothy, hey, when you go and preach, he was talking to Jews. He said, you're going to have to get circumcised. They're not going to accept you. They're not going to be able to relate to you if you don't follow some of their dietary laws and if you don't get circumcised. Then he turned right around, and this is Titus, who was going to preach at the church in Galatia. And he said, hey, guess what? You don't have to be circumcised because these guys, they're still trying to all figure this out. They're trying to earn their salvation through works. And so he said, in this instance, it's better for you to not get circumcised. And that's a really good thing because, listen, uh, a friend of mine, his baby boy was circumcised, and that poor kid could not walk for a year. That did not go over well at all. Some of you got that. I kept that in there. I tried to drop that on the first service, and it was silent, man. That's all right, man. I like, I like it. I saw Scott smile. Okay. Good circumcision joke. So we have to do that. We have to understand. Like, God does not want us to be so weird. Nobody can relate to us. But we have the truth, and it's our job to take this with us everywhere we go. You know, contending for the faith, I like to say this, it's not about being really good at arguing with people. It's about being really good at living underneath the authority of God's word. Jesus is the one that told us to be, be prepared to endure suffering, to be, to be able to handle it, to laugh off emotional scare tactics. Listen, I do not hate the trans community at all. Feel sorry for them, pray for them, see them every day. Don't feel sorry for them, but guess what? Uh, I, I have a big problem with puberty blockers being given to kids. I think it's a horrible idea for kids uh, that can't vote or drink alcohol or buy cigarettes or join the military to be able to have surgeries that would radically alter their entire life. And I don't think it's very crazy uh, for me to just say that I don't think that's a good idea. Can I get an Amen. Like I know in a lot of settings today, man, that puts a big target on your back. But man, I'm telling you, hey, that's okay, man. Like God will absolutely have your back. It's our job to defend the truth of God's word. We have to contend for our family. Like it's our, our job. And, li and listen, it's, it's not the school's job. It's not the government's job. Do you know it's actually not even just the church's job? Like your kids, if they're lucky in America right now, they'll have church about three and a half hours a month. Like that's it. It's not a lot of time. Man, the, the church is supposed to be, and I know here it is, a place, man, where you can come and you can bring your family and you're gonna hear just bold, 
preaching. You're going to hear the uncompromising truth of God's word. But I mean, let me, like, let me just tell, tell you something. Like, it's the parents' job. It's our job to make sure our kids get this. Kate and I, we just, um, we, we worked on a, really a Bible study, a six weeks Bible, Bible study. It's called On Purpose Parenting. And we're hoping to release it here at some point in the future. And really what it's about is raising kids in a culture gone mad, like where we live right now. Like what does that look like? But there's so many studies and there's so many, uh, so much data out there really from secular studies that prove overwhelmingly. Like, like it's, all, it's common for us to hear parents talk about you know, I'm just so worried about the influence. I don't know who has all the influence in my kid's life. Taylor Swift, TikTok, and social media, like whatever. I don't know. But I'm telling you this, the parents by far are the most influential factors in a child's life. Like it's not even close. And specifically, man, I just want to brag on you guys that are here today with your family. Like you have no idea the good that you are doing, moms and dads, just by being here, just by modeling the example of God's word is important. We're gonna get up, we're gonna honor our Lord Jesus Christ, and we will go to church. Like just because you're doing that speaks volumes in a child's life. Really what I call this is, is the model is the method. We're supposed to be imitators of Christ, and our children are going to imitate us. And here's the truth. You know, you, you might have a lot of important conversations in your life, but I'm going to tell you this, the most important conversations that you'll ever have in your life will not take place in a boardroom. They're going to take place in a bedroom when you tuck your kids at night and you pray with them and you make sure they understand that to mom and dad, what matters the most is what God said. And through him and because of him, all things are possible. Man, you do that and you watch what God will do in the life of your kids. And I also want to say this, man, like if you're here and you're a dad, like specifically, I love to, to just point this out where I go now. If you're a dad and you're here with your kids, like you're rare. Like what you're doing is so incredibly valuable. Our culture beats up masculinity we hear things like toxic masculinity, and it's really an, it's, it's a, it's an affront. It's an assault on men because the devil knows how much weight and how much influence you carry. And so if you're here today as a dad with your kids, there's about a 90% chance that your kids are going to grow up, they're going to stay at church, and they're going to raise their kids to obey this. So thank you for what you're doing. In fact, let's just, yeah, man, let's just tell all the dads in the house today, thank you for what you're doing. The granddads that have had to step up, the uncles that have stepped up, like what you're doing matters so much. And I, I like to say this, you know, the greatest thing that you might ever achieve in your life might not be building a, a business or wealth. The greatest thing that you might ever achieve in your life very well could be someone that you raise. Morality, spiritual development, character, these are taught by the parent. This is a secular study. If children see them as a priority in their parents' lives, they will very likely do the same when they're older. You know, I, something that I see, and I, I'm seeing more of this in the education system, it's just called like choice architecture. And, it, and it's common, but it's our job to be able to guard the hearts of our kids. They see things, they're trying to process things all the time. My little girl, she, she got upset, like she saw rainbow flags in all our neighbor's yard. And she's like, Dad, I want a rainbow flag. Like, can't we have one? I'm like, no, babe, we're not, we're not putting a rainbow flag. And she's like, Dad, but it means God keeps his promises. And I'm like, that's right. Like, and I love that. I love that that is what she associates a rainbow with. But it is our job as parents to guard what is planted in their hearts. Contending for your family is guarding what gets there. You know, the good news really is, parents, is we have so much opportunity to stop at any time and set new priorities. You have, you have so much opportunity to turn the phone off to get rid of social media if you need to. I'm just telling you, don't be afraid to step up. Don't be afraid to do that. There's things like choice, choice architecture that I see commonly in, 
and kids are getting hit with this stuff, and it basically goes something like this. Hey, are you pro-choice, or do you oppose women's rights? Do you support BLM, or are you spreading white nationalism? Are you tolerant and affirming, or do you support hate? Do you support biological males competing in women's sports, or are you a transphobe? And I know we hear that, and we think that's just silly, and that's nonsense, but, but what does that do to the heart in the mind of an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old? And so I'm just saying, man, like contending for our family is something that we absolutely have to step up. We have to be engaged. Listen to me. I thank God for our youth pastors. Like dad said, I know, man, we just had 20 kids filled with the spirit. So man, I just wanna say thank you to our youth pastors, the kids team, the volunteers, the guys taking off work to make these trips happen. Like what you're doing speaks of volumes and it's making a difference. So man, can we just tell those guys, I know they got back late last night, but some of those trips, man, some of those camps, some of that time away from the devices and social media, it absolutely changed my life when I was young. Something that we all have to do is, is really contend for the future. We have a job. Psalm 71, 18 says, now I'm old, and I'm gray. It says, but do not abandon me, O God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. Like that's his prayer. You know, I, I used to hear it said all the time, well, man, you know, you, you, you can't legislate morality. Like you can't do it. And I get it. They're saying, well, you can't pass a law and change someone's heart. Well, no. You, you can't do that, but all legislation is, all laws are, is someone's morality that is going to get passed and turned into a law. Like, I don't want people to be able to kill, steal, and destroy my stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? And so when it comes to contending for the future, next time you hear somebody say, well, you know, we, we just, we're not called to be political you know, I, I just, I really don't think that you can legislate morality. I want you to have permission, man, to just push back. Because all that is, the, the only thing that's in question is whose morals, whose morality is going to become law. Like, that's it. That's what is up for grabs in our nation right now. And so, of course, we contend for the future by staying informed, by supporting godly candidates, men and women. And we don't always get it right, I know. We don't put all of our hopes and our trust in politics, of course not. We have a God in heaven that's on the throne, and that's not changing. But we do have to play our part and stay informed. One of the saddest things I think that I see in Scripture, to be honest about it, is if you go back and you read like Chronicles and, and Kings and Samuel, typically this is kind of what happens. God's people in the Old Testament, they would start doing pretty good. They would, they would get in a huge mess, and then they would repent, and they would turn back to God, and then there would be a king that would come to power, and, and they would do okay for a while. But then if you read, you read the history of the Hebrew nation, this is typically what happens. It says, and then a new king came to power who did not honor God. He did not walk with God, and he did not keep his commandments. And so what happened is the whole culture turned to idol worship. We have just as many idols today. Actually, we probably have more. In our culture, in our society today, we worship sex, body type, money, wealth, all the same vices. Like, that has not changed. It's the same then. It's the same now. We just call it different things. But that's typically what happens. And the reason it takes place is because one generation stopped. And they were not able to do what the psalmist wrote. He said, don't abandon me, O God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation. Like we, as the church, we have to pass off the baton of faith to the ones coming up after us. Man, and I'm so proud and I'm so thankful for the victory. I mean, it is packed out today. We've got all these young people up here. Like, you guys are going to have to start a third service really soon. Like, this is incredible, man. But, but really, like, thank you for being involved and in serving. This is how you contend for the future. It was Ronald Reagan, and I, and I absolutely love this quote. 
of his. And, and this is what he said. He said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. And that's certainly the truth about the gospel. Somebody might say, like, why even share a message like this? Like, why talk about this? I had somebody tell me one time, this is like just, you know, you're in Texas. This is like waving red meat in front of a crowd, which I don't even think that's really the, the truth anymore. But, but why do that? And here's why. Because, man, there's people that I talk to, and they get beat up at school all week. They get beat down. They're told what they should say, what they should think, how they should feel, how they should raise their kids, what their views should be. And there's a lot of people that are honestly scared to stand up boldly and, and speak up for the truth. And I am so thankful to God for churches like this right here that we're in together that have preached the uncompromised truth of God's word for 30 years. Like this is contending for the future. This is what the enemy absolutely hates because he knows it is transforming lives in generation after generation. So thank you for being a part of it and thank you for serving on the usher team and the worship team. Thank you for, for volunteering in the kids team and again going on these trips because that's what contending looks like. Right now in my office, I work over by um, White Rock Lake in Dallas off of Garland Road. That's where I'm at. And, and so right down the road, there, there's this beautiful building. It's a big, gorgeous church, giant steeple, and it's just been there for decades. And I'm sure probably 30 years ago, it was full of families and life and kids. It probably looked a lot like it looks in here. And, and so it was a powerhouse over there in East Dallas, except today it's a parking lot and it's condos because there was a group of people there that they just said, you know what, this is the way we like it. We, we were actually in love with our personal preferences more than we're in love with Jesus. And so they did not change and they did not pass this baton of faith down to the ones coming up after them. That, that handoff never took place. And you see that, and you see these old empty churches, honestly, all over Dallas and all over the big cities of the world today. Jude told us, and he warned us of what would happen and what this looked like. And it's a call to us. It's a call to me, you, as followers of Christ. He, he closed his letter out in verse 17, and he said, but you, my dear friends, he says, remember what the apostle, our Lord Jesus Christ, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. It says, they told you that in the last times there would be scoffers. Have you ever met one of those? <laughs> I've, I've met a few. It says, there'll be scoffers whose purpose is to live, to live is to satisfy their ungodly desires. It says, these people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. And then he tells us what to do. He says, so this is what you're supposed to do. In this crazy world, in this insane culture, where we're calling evil good and good evil, which Jesus said would happen, he said, like, don't panic. Don't lose hope. He, he's already overcome the world. Like, we already know how the story ends. But he says, like, don't, don't panic. Moms and dads, grandparents, don't panic. He said, this is, this is what you need to focus on. Build each other up in the most holy faith. That's what we're doing right now. We're building each other up. We're worshiping the one true living God in this house today together. That's what we're doing. Then he says, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in praying in the Holy Spirit. And maybe you don't know what all that means, but maybe, maybe you think, well, man, that's weird. Well, probably is a little bit weird. <laughs> There's a lot of things in the Bible that are weird. Jesus walking on water is weird. Turning water into wine is weird. It's weird. It's weird that God chose to speak to Moses through a burning bush. That's kind of weird. It's kind of weird that Abraham, when he was 100 years old, God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and through your bloodline, I'm going to save the human race. That's kind of odd. It's kind of weird. But Jesus said it was better for him to go to heaven and send the Holy Spirit. It was to our advantage. So I believe in praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And if Jesus said it was good for me, and if he said we needed it, I believe everything else that he did. I believe everything else that happened in the Bible. I believe that a giant fish swallowed Jonah. I believe that. I believe the grave could not hold our Lord Jesus Christ. He came up out of the grave. That's a little bit strange. I believe that, so you better believe I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's here, and it's available, and we need it right now, church. Like, you need it, parents, grandparents, you need it. But he says, don't, don't forget that. Don't discredit that. And he says, listen, await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, await. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming back. Like, we don't have to lose hope. Like, it's, it's easy, I think, sometimes to just look around and think this is all that there is. And we forget, because we're carnal, but we forget that, man, this is a vapor, and this is going to be over so fast. And what awaits us is eternity. And Scripture tells us that Jesus is coming back. He's coming in the clouds. He's going to have a crown on his head. He's going to wear a robe, and there's going to be a a name written on it that says, King of kings, the Lord of lords. And those scoffers, the Bible says a lot of the nations of the earth are going to see it. They're going to see him coming back. And it says they will mourn because they're going to know their time to bend their knee and bow to the lordship of Jesus Christ has passed. But not you and not me and not your kids, and not my kids, because we willfully submit and bow our knee to the name of Jesus Christ now. Because we recognize that he is the one true living God, and scripture tells us in Revelations 22 that he's coming back, and he says, behold, I am bringing my recompense with me to give to every man according to what they've done. And he says, remain steadfast and true, and don't let up, don't let off the gas. He said, because I'm coming back, and I'm bringing my reward with me. Can I get an amen? Will you bow your head? I'm going to pray. Father, we just come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I just thank you that you're raising up parents. Lord, you're just filling them with renewed vigor and power and purpose. Lord, help us all to contend for the faith, and, and not be afraid to, to speak up boldly. Lord, we're not trying to start fights. You said, Lord, you told us to, to, to strive for peace, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not possible. So in those moments, Lord, give us the courage to step up boldly and proclaim the truth of your word that sets people free. I pray for that. I pray that for everybody in here. I pray that for the young people in high school, and college, and junior high. Lord, I pray that over all the kids in the house today. Help them be bold, Lord. When it's uncomfortable, and when it's not cool, and when we're ridiculed and mocked, Lord, you told us in your word, you said, blessed are you. When people insult you, if they persecute you, and they say all kinds of evil against you because of me, he said, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Lord, grant us boldness. Help us contend, Lord, for our families in a culture gone crazy. And Lord, help us to hold on to your promise. You said, await this incredible hope that we have, that you're coming back. Lord, we know you will get the world in order. And we pray, Lord Jesus, come. We're looking forward to that moment. But, Father, we're also thankful today that you give us the victory now. Like we have the victory and power now. We're not helpless. We're not defeated. We're not victims. Father, we are children of the living God. And Scripture says that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You said if we would share in your suffering, if we would share in the persecution, that we would also share in your reward. And we thank you for it today. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in this church, in these families, in this next generation. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, God bless you guys.